Hey guys, this is Dr. Aman Sethia. From so, we'll discuss some high yield questions. So, let us start with the first question. A chest X-ray shows markings in following image. So, what they're asking you, they're asking you what these markings are called. So, if you see these markings, these are uh, perpendicular markings. What we call them? We call them as curly B lines. These are curly B lines. So, cause of marking cannot be, see the question carefully, they are asking you what cannot be. So, simple they are asking you a question like all are cause of curly B line except. So, we should know where we see curly B lines. So, understand this, uh, these are uh, arrows pointing towards these curly B lines and these lines uh, we see in uh, condition like in mitral stenosis. And sometimes you can see this in pulmonary edema. You can see these curly B lines uh, sometime in uh, different uh, atypical pneumonia. Atypical pneumonia means it could be either viral or uh, mycoplasma pneumonia. And you can see these uh, line in congenital lymphangiectasia. That is, uh, these are some congenital cause. So we can say congenital lymphangiectasia. So these are the causes of curly B lines. So simple question they are asking you all are causes of curly B lines except so we can see here nematocele. Nematocele is a cavitatory lesion. So this is uh, I can say it's a cavity or cavitatory lesion. So this will present uh, like cavitation mass and this is uh, most common cause for this most common cause is staph aureus. Most common cause is staph aureus and remember this uh, nematocele is not a cause of curly B line. So answer for this question will be nematocele. So you can see this answer will be nematocele. Okay, coming to uh, next question, you can see, let us uh, first highlight the hint in the clinical case. This is the clinical case. So the first hint in the MCQ itself is an age. So 62 year old, then hint is female patient. So you can see elderly female, progressively right sided weakness and speech difficulty since one month. So this is means like a female is uh, having some sort of, uh, I can say, hemiparesis or weakness. So there is an impending stroke in this patient. Fundus examination shows the condition as represented in the picture below. So you can see this picture. So let me show you this picture. You can see here disc edema. So this picture is suggestive of papillary edema. Two months ago, she had history a fall in her bathroom and struck her head against a wall. Missed two months before she had a history of falls. So second hint is history of fall. Most likely diagnosis. So by uh, looking at this question, you can see the patient is having papillary edema. So papillary edema can occur due to hypertension. This papillary edema can occur due to some sort of, I can say, bleed when, when intracranial pressure is raised or I, I can say intraocular pressure is more. So you can see this patient is having, uh, let's see the option. Can it be due to Alzheimer's disease? Alzheimer's disease, remember, this will present with a more a memory impairment. So this is not the answer. Alzheimer's disease will present with memory impairment. So there is no nothing like that. Left parietal glioma. Left parietal glioma will produce uh, parietal lobe syndrome. So again, that is not the answer. Left MC tertiary stroke. <coughs> this could be MC tertiary stroke, but uh, that is uh, very less or unlikely producing papilledema. So this is a case of chronic subdural hematoma. So in chronic subdural hematoma, you will see the patient can develop uh, papillary edema and some other symptoms like there can be visual blurring, there can be headache. So these are the signs that we see in a patient of because there is history of fall, fall uh, like the, almost two months ago. So that is a case of chronic. So this is, I can say, a case of chronic papillary edema or chronic uh, subdural hematoma causing papillary edema. Okay, coming to next question, which of the following is not seen in ABP? ABP means allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So you can see this is the condition uh, due to aspergillus fungus. So what are the symptoms you can see in aspergillus? A patient can develop mainly pulmonary manifestation. So wheeze, cough and fever. Cough is seen. Allergic uh, ABP, how we diagnose, we make a diagnosis like uh, you will see the patient IgE levels are high. So mostly you can see IgE levels are more than 1000. So there is eosinophils counts are also more than how high. So these eosinophil counts are more, IgE levels are more. So it's mainly a respiratory condition. So pneumonia is also seen, recurrent pneumonia is seen. Skin rash is something that, that is not a classical feature. Heavy. However, we can see this due to some, uh, some drug that we used to treat this condition. But remember, Skin rash is not a classical feature that we see in a patient of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis. So this is like a, again an easy question. Like we see 
ABP as a respiratory condition, so mostly symptoms will be due to respiratory cause. Like I can say there will be cough, there will be fever, there will be sometime episodic chest pain, there can be recurrent pneumonia, there, there will be asthma-like symptom, I can say bronchospasm, these. Uh, so these are kind of symptoms you will see in a patient. A 30-year-old, 30-year-old present with diarrhea. So let's see the hint. Diarrhea is the hint. Confusion, high-grade fever and bilateral pneumonitis. So patient is telling you patient is having high grade fever and bilateral pneumonia. So that is means patient is having pneumonia. So which pneumonia can also produce diarrhea? That is the hint in the question. So I can say which pneumonia. So this is like uh, a case of Legionnaire disease. So diagnosis for this condition will be a condition called Legionnaire disease. So Legionnaire disease remember this is caused by Legionella. So where uh, I can say it is like a patient will develop a diarrhea, confusion, there will be high grade fever, there can be uh, pneumonia. So this is uh, watery diarrhea, remember diarrhea is seen in Legionella around 20 to 25 percent patient will develop diarrhea. Right. So then you can see uh, some of these patients they can also develop confusion because in pneumonia you know like curve 65 score ultimately patient can develop some uh, pulmonary uh, renal component so urea will be elevated there will be mental confusion so that is the feature of any pneumonia but diarrhea here is the hint and I, I can say the treatment for this condition we can give macro ladder we can give respiratory fluorocanolones following antibodies are commonly seen in Jogren syndrome so let us see this question in Jogren syndrome what antibody you will see so if I start with this antibody anti topoisomerase antibody this anti topoisomerase is also called as the commercial name is anti SCL70 anti SL70 and this is seen in systemic sclerosis. Systemic sclerosis is a form of uh, systemic form of scleroderma. So we will see anti topoisomerase. If I say anti centromere, anti centromere is seen in Crest syndrome. Anti centromere antibody you will see in Crest syndrome. This uh, Crest stand for uh, calcinosis, Raynaud phenomena esophageal dysmotility, sclerodactyly and telangiectasia. So Crest syndrome you will see anti centromere antibody. So these two Crest syndrome is what remember this is uh, I can say a localized form of scleroderma. This is localized scleroderma. Means I can say in systemic form you will see uh, more visceral organ involvement and, and remember the cause of death here the cause of death will be pulmonary fibrosis and that is uh, causing pH. pH means pulmonary artery hypertension. Pulmonary artery hypertension. Anti U1 RNP. Anti U1 RNP is anti U1 ribonucleoprotein. This is seen in a condition called MCTD. Mixed connective tissue disorder where patient will have uh, two or more autoimmune disease in a single person. An anti row, the last option is left. Anti row is also called as SSA. SSA means Jogren syndrome A. SSA, so you can see the name itself. This SSA, this is the answer. Anti row is seen in Jogren syndrome. So, in Jogren syndrome, you can see antibodies like anti row. Anti row is also called as SSA, Jogren syndrome A. And second antibody that we see is called anti la. SSB, we also call this SSB. Jogan syndrome B. Antero antila. Antero antibody, remember, this is also present in a condition called uh, neonatal SLE. In neonatal SLE, you will see antero antibodies. So, answer for this question will be antero. Okay, most common type of MS. Most common type of MS. So, we can have different varieties of MS. So, I can say the common type. So, let me say this is a person. So we can see different types of MS. So in, in one condition, we will see patient is having relapse of symptoms. Symptoms are there, then normal. Symptoms they are normal. So that is called a relapsing and remitting type. So means like I can say like January, February, March, a lot of symptom. April, May, very less symptom. May, June, April, June, June, July, patient is having minimal symptoms. Or then August again there is a flare. So there will be flare of symptom, then normal. So that is called relapsing remitting type. So patient will have a lot of symptoms then patient will be normal for a few, few days that is called as most common type. Sometime you will see the patient is having only increase in symptom. 
only increase in symptom means symptom will keep on increasing. We call this primary progressive type. So this is your relapsing remitting type. This is your primary progressive. Third type we will see we call this initially it will like it will be like uh, relapsing remitting relapsing remitting. Then this will keep on progressing. Then this will keep on progressing. We call this we call this as secondary. So just uh, let me say this is your one primary progressive. This will be your two. Secondary progressive will be like this means initially it will be like uh, symptom on and off then there will be keep on progressing. Fourth is your uh, progressive relapsing means patient is having initially relapsing type then this will be like a normal type. Uh, this is like fourth type. Uh, Sometimes you will see a fifth type. Uh, fifth type is called uh, we call this as a very low grade. So patient will have only low grade symptom like this minimal symptom. We call this benign type, this fifth type. So just uh, let me label these. This first one will be relapsing or remitting type. The second one will be primary progressive type. This third one, uh, third one will be secondary progressive type. And fourth one you can see this is called progressive relapsing type. And this is called benign type. Benign type means patient will have minimal symptoms. So that is a uh, low threshold or sub threshold symptoms. The most common type that we see is relapsing remitting type of MS, multiple sclerosis. And I can say this multiple sclerosis is most common demyelinating CNS disease. Okay, following drug is avoided in WPW syndrome. WPW is your Wolf Parkinson White syndrome. So you all know like in Wolf Parkinson White syndrome what we have, uh, we have aberrant conduction pathway. So like normally we see impulse travel from SA node to AV node then a bundle of face per Kenji fiber but if you see there is an abnormal impulse so I can say with the green I am drawing this is an aberrant pathway impulse is traveling through ab aberrant pathway that is called this aberrant conduction pathway so impulse is not normally traveling like I can say this is your SC node this is your AV node then you can see bundle of fish bundle of fish and per Kenji fiber but here impulse traveling by some abnormal pathway or aberrant pathway this abnormal pathway is called as bundle of Kent bundle of Kent so in, in this uh, I can say which drug is avoided so remember uh, there are uh, patient will develop arrhythmia so which drug we should avoid so remember in this patient we will avoid drugs like digoxin so digoxin is avoided the reason is this digoxin will increase uh, contractibility so you will see there will be a direct connection because of this bypass tract we call this bundle of Kent or bypass tract if you give if you give digoxin uh, so I can say if you give digoxin or any other uh, drugs that increase contractibility like verapamil because you will see this will increase conduction bypass this will increase conduction bypass <coughs> Adenosine procainamide, adenosine basically that this is the drug of choice for PSVT. So we can give adenosine in patient with PSVT. Procainamide, amidron also we can give because these are anti arrhythmic drugs. So these drugs can be given but remember digoxin is avoided because this will increase uh, conduction by bypass tract. Now if I say uh, what else they can ask you in WPW, they ask an MCQ. In WPW syndrome, here you will see a classical finding that is what we call in ECG you will see delta waves you will see delta waves. What is now delta waves? Understand this. This is like uh, uh, a slurry upstroke of QRS. So you will see this is your P wave. And you will see QRS will be like this. This slurry upstroke of QRS is called delta wave. So this is a slurry upstroke of uh, QRS that we see in a patient of WPW syndrome. Okay, so this is the condition they are asking you what is the diagnosis. So first you should know what this condition is called. So this condition is associated with, so this is called a keratoderma blenorejica. We call this as keratoderma blenorejica. So this is a condition you can see there will be uh, painful lesions in palms and so on and this is uh, mainly seen mainly seen in a patient uh, with uh, Reiter syndrome or reactive arthritis. This reactive arthritis is also called as Reiter syndrome. So in Reiter syndrome initially patient will develop uh, I can say 
the manifestation like uh, there will be uh, patient can have enterocolitis or patient can have uh, smstd like there can be infection with chlamydia mycoplasma ureoplasma yersinia salmonella shigella these are the infective agent and ultimately then uh, the patient will have a, a classical triad that triad will be there will be uh, conjunctivitis so i can say can't see can't pee and remember can't dance with me can't dance with me so can't see means patient will have conjunctivitis uh, can't pee means there will be urethritis because of chlamydia or yersinia or any other infection and there can be can't dance with me means there will be arthritis so conjunctivitis and they will have later on they can develop this classical skin lesion we call this keratoderma blinorigica so this is a case of reactive arthritis in psoriasis you can later on develop a psoriatic arthritis for this we have a diagnostic criteria we call this uh, casper criteria for lupus we can develop a lupus uh, arthropathy like uh, sometimes there will be deformed initially it's non deforming later on it will become deforming we call this jacquard's arthropathy in seborrheic dermatitis you will see uh, like uh, sebo dermatitis basically in the facial areas not here not in palm sensors okay now see this condition a 60 year old so let me highlight this 60 year old patient with difficulty in walking and pain in knee since six months pain in the knee since six months so when i see a question on knee pain morning stiffness four five to ten minutes sometimes so this is like this is given this is given to confuse you morning stiffness you should mark down so you should think and you will mark down so rheumatoid arthritis so this is just given to confuse you so understand this in rheumatoid arthritis it will last for more than half an hour so more than half an hour sometimes more than 45 minutes so here given only five to ten minutes so that is not a hint so here the hint is pain in knees since six months considering age and complaint of patient got an x-ray done look on looking x-ray think of it being what you can see here so you can see here uh, now uh, we can see the changes in the x-ray you can see the degenerative changes here right so you can see this uh, like there is a degenerative changes in the articular cartilage so this is considering age of the patient so psoriatic arthritis remember this is mainly affecting dip in ankylosing spondylitis this will affect your spine and gout will mainly affect your first mtp so whenever i see a question on knee joint involvement so i'll have three differential in my brain so if you see the involvement of knee joint so there will be three differentials first differential and the most common cause will be oa oa means osteoarthritis second differential uh, which i should think of is your pseudo gout because pseudo gout is also the most common joint affected knee and third will be septic arthritis septic arthritis so by looking at x ray i can see there is degenerative changes so the diagnosis is clear here osteoarthritis but remember in pseudo gout uh, they will give you some hint like uh, there is calcium hydroxy appetite or calcium pyrophosphate crystal accumulation that crystals they, they can mention or they will give you some history related to calcium overload in septic arthritis the patient will be febrile there will be fever there will be swollen knee so you can see there is as no as such swelling in the knee there will be swollen swollen a painful knee there will be feature of sepsis leukocyte counts will be high so this is again a case of osteoarthritis okay coming to next question a patient of age 52 year 52 year old patient with acute clinical symptom of fever headache localized to temporal low here patient is having headache and jaw pain whenever she talk or chew so that is a jaw pain or claudication patient is having esr and crp are what is the diagnosis so you can see like uh, mostly it is seen in uh, female more than 60 year but here 52 is given so based on the symptom you can see headache is there fever is there temporal lobe involvement means uh, temporal arthritis and jaw pain so that is a classical case of temporal arthritis temporal arthritis is also called as giant cell arthritis temporal arthritis is also called as giant cell arthritis so remember here the patient will complain of common complication like there will be there will be headache so most common symptom you can see headache then patient can develop jaw claudication or jaw pain so pain during uh, mastication during uh, chewing during sometimes facial pain during smiling also then remember the most uh, uh, dreaded complication or most uh, dangerous complication is there is risk of blindness there is risk of blindness and uh, a few patient uh, later on can develop a complication that sometimes they ask in mcqs so th this is associated with the condition like some patient will develop uh, fatigue uh, joint pain 
muscle pain that is called polymyalgia so basically it's a rheumatoid arthritis like picture we call this polymyalgia rheumatica polymyalgia rheumatica so that is seen here 32 year old male patient coming to next question 32 year old male patient hospital with chief complaint of painful and recurrent genital ulcers HLA B57 is preponderance. So, what is the You can see the genital ulcers in the image. So, these are the pathognomonic feature where we see oral ulcers, genital ulcers, and the positive pathology test. I repeat, oral ulcers, genital ulcers, and positive pathology test. This is the classical case of Basset syndrome. So, we also call this Basset syndrome or silk root disease. So, this is the case of Basset syndrome. So, patient will develop oral ulcers. There will be genital ulcers. And there will be a positive pathology test. So most common ulcers, I can say most common ulcers are oral ulcers, but most specific ones are genital ulcers. So you can see the patient is having both are painful. So recurrent on the recurrent word is the hint. So this is like a young patient and actually B51 or sometime actually B50, these are classical association. Right. So, this is a, a classical case that we see in a patient of Basset syndrome. So, diagnosis will be Basset syndrome. It is not an STD because there is no history of sexual intercourse or any infection. No gonorrhea again because uh, there is no HLA association with any of these STDs. So, gonorrhea syphilis are ruled out. So, diagnosis will be Basset syndrome. Okay, 38 year old female, you can see 38 year old. Chief complaint of dry eyes. Bilateral parotid swelling and difficulty in chewing food. What is the diagnosis? So you can see dry eyes is a hint. Parotid gland infiltration. So you will see this parotid gland swelling means there will be lymphocyte infiltration in parotid gland. Lymphocyte infiltration into parotid gland. So what could be the possible option? Let's see. Keratoconjunctivitis sicca means Jogren syndrome. So basically here you will see the eye manifestation. So that is only eye manifestation that is not seen because they have mentioned dry eyes along with some other things. So in keratoconjunctivitis, you will see only problem in the eyes. So here patient is having problem in the parotid gland as well. So dental caries, no. Dental caries will not produce parotid gland swelling. Even a bilateral is unlikely. Basic syndrome is not having such presentation. In Basic, I told you they will have a recurrent oral ulcers, recurrent genital ulcers and positive pathology test. So this is a case of a Jogren syndrome. This is a case of Jogren syndrome. You can clearly see the parotid swelling. So differential diagnosis for this will become mumps. But considering the age of patient, 38 year old female, then dryness in the eyes, how you will manage this? So you will manage this by giving artificial tears. So now even we have uh, new drugs for Jogren syndrome. They can ask an MCQ. So drug that is approved for uh, dry mouth and dry sevimilin. If there is no improvement with sevimilin, what we can give? We can give pilocarpin. Pilocarpin. So, this is a case of Jogren syndrome. Okay, so patient is known case of Crohn's disease. So, what we can see with red tender finding. So, you can see this this uh, red tender finding we call this as erythema nodosum. So, erythema nodosum is a cutaneous manifestation which we can see in many conditions, right? So, like it can occur after drug, you can see this with sarcoidosis, you can see this with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis. So, this is one of the, I can say, extra intestinal manifestation of Crohn's disease. So, answer is erythema nodosum. Sweet syndrome, pyoderma, gangrenosum, ichthyma, these are also manifestations that we see uh, in Crohn's syndrome. But remember, these are uh, not presenting like this uh, round, round, tender um, uh, lesions presenting over your skin of your uh, tibial area or in your legs. So, these are this can be present anywhere. So, this is the case of erythema nodosum. Okay, now see seven year old girl. So, let us see the hint first. Seven year old girl. Complaint of hyperactivity. Girl is very active. Injury to self means self mutilation. Learning disability means mental retardation with prolonged history of seizures. So, what, what you can see, what you can see here. So, let's see one by one what they can see. So, first let me see. I am knowing nothing about this question. So, I can see something. In the face, I can see these are, uh, you can see in the nasal, nasal area also. These are called adenoma sebaceum. So, this is called adenoma sebaceum. So there is hypertrophy of sebaceous gland. 
hypertrophy of the sebaceous gland so in considering the age of patient the recurrent seizure is the hint so prolonged history of seizure means patient is having seizure so this is i can say you can see here uh, in mri this is an mri brain you can see there are multiple angiofibromas okay even if mri is, is not given you can see you can see these are uh, sorry let me just uh, correct this you can see these are like uh, adenoma sebaceum in this nasal area then we can see multiple angiofibromas here in mri you can see uh, these lesions uh, what we can call them we can call them like uh, these are uh, some uh, tumor like growth these are tumor like growth we call them potato like tumor we call them potato like tumors right these are potato like tumors uh, we can call them sub ependymal hematoma <coughs> or tubers so these are some of the tumors so there is a condition uh, which present with epiloa epiloa means a classical triad epiloa epi means epilepsy which is given here seizure low means low iq so epilepsy is given low iq learning disability means low iq and adenoma sebaceum which is given in the image so this is the classical finding we see in a patient of tuberous sclerosis in a patient of tuberous sclerosis right so understand this periventricular nodular heterotrophia is a rare condition where you will not see you can see seizure patient can develop but you will not see the cutaneous finding birhock duber syndrome again you will not see seizures here then you can see it in men one syndrome you can see we have three p's right like, like pituitary tumors parathyroid tumors and uh, parathyroid tumor or parathyroid hyperplasia and pancreatic tumor like gastrinomas so there is nothing like men one syndrome so diagnosis is tuberous sclerosis so this is a not somal dominant condition and uh, i can say the other feature you can see there will be uh, skin rash that rash is called as ash leaf spot hypopigmented rash sometimes you can see a boggy swelling in the truncal area that boggy swelling is called as uh, shagreen patch hyperpigmented boggy swelling so these are features that we see in a patient of tuberous sclerosis okay let's first see the hint 32 year old male following image finding so let's see the image what you can see in this image i can see there is an image this is a male patient but looking like a female you can see the nose this node is like uh, we can call this a saddle nose so there is nose deformity <coughs> you can see the patient is having nose deformity then you can see some rashes are there in the skin nothing else right so this is you can see saddle nose and nothing uh, classical here what else we can see necrotizing vasculitis so means it's again a question on vasculitis all of the following are seen in classical triad except so let us see what we have so this is like a patient with saddle nose so where we can see necrotizing vascular saddle nose we can see in a condition called wagner's granulomatosis so in wagner's granulomatosis what we can see we can see patient can develop upper respiratory tract infection there will be lower respiratory tract infection and there will be kidney manifestation so these, this is a classical triad classical triad means you can see the patient can develop a recurrent urti upper respiratory tract like there can be nasal polyp rhinitis sinusitis lrti means there will be bronchitis so patient will complete of hem hemoptysis kidney manifestation patient can develop hematuria so remember rhinitis hemoptysis hematuria so these are the classical findings git involvement can occur in few patient but let, that is not considered a part of triad that's not classical so answer will be git so other features are seen so git involvement is not seen so this is a case of wagner's granulomatosis remember in wagner's you will find a c anka the antibody that will find is c anka and treatment for wagner uh, steroids mostly are uh, not uh, effective so how we manage we manage by giving a cyclophosphamide cyclophosphamide okay higher magnification view is shown using uh, galea silver staining in the image below so silver stain is the hint of middle temporal lobe identify the structure indicated by arrow and arrow head respectively so arrow and arrow head they are asking you what it is so you can see in this image so what we can see in this arrow these are like a triangular structure these triangular structure are called as neurofibrillary tangles then we can see these are uh, like a plague 
we call this these triangles they can make a plague we call this uh, uh neuro triangles uh, like amyloid protein is depositing so we can see this uh, neuritic plague what do we call this we call this neuritic plague So neuritic plaque and neurofibrillar tangles, these tangles are made up of tau proteins. So now uh, most of the you are knowing the answer, it's, it's the case of Alzheimer's disease. So let's see the option one by one. A fibrillar nature of tangles in neuritic plaque seen in Alzheimer's disease, that is the possible option. So let me keep this an option, this could be the answer. Fibrillar nature of tangles in neuritic seen in Parkinson's disease, no, they are seen in Alzheimer's disease. Neuritic, they are, again Parkinson's is not the answer. Neurotic place and five nature of tangles in multiple multiple system atrophy. You know. So in Parkinson's disease, what we will see, we will see a, in Parkinson you will see there will be pallor of substantia nigra. So in both these question in Parkinson's disease, what you will see, you will see there will be pallor of substantia nigra. You will see that substantia nigra will be less black in color. Uh, sometime in MRI uh, you can see there will be loss of swallow tail sign. Uh, that is a rare, not seen again in, in every patient. In MSA. Multisystem atrophy, you will see in MRI hot cross bun sign. Hot cross bun sign. So, this is a case of Alzheimer's disease, and what we will see, we will see neurofibrillary tangles and neurotic plague. With respect to the type of above mentioned addict, which the following is correct. First, you can see the localization of this addict. This is like hemicrania. This is hemicrania. Hemicrania means half side headaches, so half side headache is most most likely could be your migraine. So let me see the option. There is a repeated episode of headache lasting for 4 to 72 hours. That is true. So remember in, in migraine, remember how we make a diagnosis of migraine. So migraine diagnosis we make, so patient should have headache. That should be unilateral. The duration of headaches should be 4 to 72 hours. The headache is pulsatile in nature. So patient is having a unilateral headache of 4 to 72 hours duration, pulsatile nature. And remember this headache is a never mild headache. It is either moderate or severe. So it is a moderate to severe headache. Then I can say point number 5 uh, I am writing here. The headache will associate with nausea or vomiting. And point number 6 which I am writing here, there will be photophobia or phonophobia. So you can see I have written these six features. So how to make a diagnosis, clinical diagnosis of migraine we make. On which ground we make a diagnosis if you see any two features from this list, any one from nausea or vomiting. If both are present that is very good. If any one is there and any one from this list. So 211, remember 211 this is how we make a diagnosis of migraine. So migraine diagnosis is clinical. So let's see now option. This repeated episode of headache lasting 4 to 7, that is true. This, this is precipitated by caffeine, contraceptive pill, sound, hunger, excess stress, lack of sleep. Yes, that is also true. Migraine can be precipitated if you consume a lot of coffee, especially after 7 p.m. Oral contraceptive, yes, that is also true. Hunger can also precipitate. Vasoactive neuropeptides, CGRP, this is calcitonin, generated peptide, CGRP, plays an important role, that is true. The recent, like there are many hypotheses for migraine, the most accepted is CGRP. Patients who are hypertensive are more from this, no, this is false. So even like migraine is seen in young patients more than old patients. You can see more younger cases of migraine and they are non-hypertensive. So there is no relation with hypertension. So answer is ABC. So let me see the answer is clear ABC. Is the following lab picture suggest type 2 hepatorenal syndrome. Hepatorenal syndrome is HRS. So there are different types of HRS. Uh, we should know two main types. Uh, one is called HRS type 1 and second is called HRS type 2. In HRS type 1 what we see we will see doubling of serum creatinine and half of GFR. GFR will be so serum creatinine will be double and GFR will be half. And this will occur in less than two weeks. So this is like a progressive disease. In uh, this type two, I can say here you will see there will be increase in serum creatinine. 
and there will be decrease in GFR but this is uh, I can say uh, over many weeks so this is like a slow or gradually over many weeks so I can say this patient is like fairly stable but uh, there will be one more finding that we see the patient will develop along with this you will see there will be refractory ascites refractory ascites means so patient is having ascites and that uh, fluid in the abdomen is not resolving even when you give uh, like maximum dose of furosemide and spinolactone like this uh, an ascites that is not resp showing response when you give even uh, I can say up to 160 mg of uh, furosemide and 400 mg of spinolactone that is the maximal dose that ascites and plus salt restriction diet so I repeat salt restriction diet Lasix of erosemide 160 mg, spinolactone 400 mg. Still, there is no relief. That ascites is called refractory ascites. So, let us see. But make sure to make a diagnosis of HRS, there should be no prior kidney damage. The previous KFT report should be normal. There should be no use of any nephrotoxic drug. So let us see the option one by one. Progressive impairment in renal function and significant reduction in kidney within one to two weeks. No, this is, this is a case of HRS type 1. This is HRS type 1, but they have asked you type 2. Reduction in GFR with an elevation of serum creatinine, but it's fairly stable. This could be the answer. Progressive impairment in renal function and significant incre increase. No, incre impairment in renal function, in increase in creatinine clearance. Now they are giving you increase in creatinine clearance within 1 to 2. No, it's not increase in creatinine clearance. It is decrease in clearance. Right? Increase in creatinine level, but not clearance. So this is not the answer. Reduction in GFR that is to decrease of serum creatinine low. Serum creatinine is increased. Now see the question they are confusing you with the creatinine clearance and creatinine level. Creatinine levels are more that is bad for you. Creatinine clearance is more that is giving you an adequate GFR. So GFR we can calculate to G indirect reflection of GFR. There are different methods to calculate GFR. Like nowadays what we prefer, we prefer to start in EPS start in C method. That's the best method. When we have MDRD equation. Then we can use Cockroft Gold formula, we can use creatinine clearance, we can use inulin clearance. So, more is the clearance that is better for you. So, this is progressive impairment in renal function and significant reduction in creatinine clearance means decrease in GFR. Reduction in clearance means reduction in GFR so that is within 1 to 2, that is HRS type 1. Reduction in global filtration rate, GFR is reduced, elevation of creatinine and it is fairly stable. This is the answer for HRS type 2. Progressive impairment in renal function. Kidney functions are impaired and significant increase in creatinine clearance. If creatinine clearance is more, it means GFR is more. That's even good for you. So this is sometime we can see. So this is a case of HRS type 1. Sorry, this is HRS type 2. If I say this thing, this thing will be a case. Progressive impairment in renal function and significant increase in creatinine clearance within 1 to 2. This can be sometime we can see in AKI. This sometimes we can see in a patient of AKI, right? Uh, so AKI is having certain phases, uh, like initiation phase. We can see sometimes this thing, AKI initiation phase. Sometimes in the recovery phase also we can see this. Reduction in GFR with decrease in creatinine levels. No, if GFR is reduced, creatinine will increase. So that is even not seen anywhere. So this is the answer for this HRS hepatorenal syndrome type 1 and type 2. So this is about some of the important questions. Just remember, keep working hard, keep revising. See you in the next video with some more knowledgeable session. Bye-bye. Till then, take care. Remember, you can, you will. Bye-bye.